Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experience for Interviews. Um, we're lucky enough to have today Neil. Neil's a really uh, an awesome fellow that I met uh, roughly, what, two weeks ago? And yeah. we've been chatting a lot about his experiences and uh, what, uh, what he's talked about has really blown my mind. And uh, I really wanted to have him on as quickly as possible. So thanks, uh, Neil, for coming on. Thanks for having me, Anik. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, well, you know, you've uh, the, the things that you've shown me, the drawings that we're going to share tonight, uh, I really wanted to share with the uh, the audience because not a lot of experiences go what you went through. So I thought that you know, to, to have you on would be uh, something positive for those that uh, get the chance to view this and some of your experiences might rub off or even uh, corroborate for some because uh, what we go through is somewhat... Uh, I can't say unnatural, but it's it's really unnormal compared mm -hmm. to others. And uh, so, having certain experiences that might corroborate to some, might uh, I guess well, people think that we're crazy, and I, I myself I think I'm crazy sometimes because sometimes I you know I go through these things that uh, I can't explain, but when I I meet somebody like you that went some that lived something that you know similar, well. I'm happy because I can relate to you and we can share notes. So I'd like to, um, if you could start from the beginning, when your experience was started and we could uh, eventually fall on to the, the images that you gave me and we could uh, explain those and, uh, and so on. Okay. Um, I like what you had to say there. The, the whole reason I'm doing this is because uh, it's been a, it's definitely a heavy burden experiencing these things. And uh, as you said, you, you go through these points when you're questioning your own sanity and, and the very nature of reality. So uh, it's easy to think that you're losing your mind, especially when you have a society that wants to deny something that it is uh, going on at, that you know full well is, is real in your reality and, and is affecting you in many different ways. So, um, my earliest memory from my childhood is uh, is growing up in my household. Uh, I shared a bedroom with my my next oldest brother, and I was probably about two and a half, maybe going on three years of age. It was probably closer to three because of of the timeline. Um, it was on Christmas Eve, and I remember waking up. I was sleeping in a crib. And my brother slept next to me in, in a, a big bed. And uh, I remember waking up in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve and, and looking over and seeing my brother. I was standing up in the crib. And, and then I remember looking out the uh, window, which was directly on the other side of the crib, um, facing out to my backyard and to the neighbor's property. And uh, I remember, uh, all I remember is bright red lights and just being amazed by whatever it was that I was looking at. And woke up in the morning and was just all excited and had to tell first thing, you know, when my parents came and got me was, uh, you know, I was, I was more excited about telling them about seeing Santa than I was about going and opening up gifts or anything like that. It was kind of like a joke for a while there because they were like, yeah, you know, like you saw Santa Claus. So, you know, three, three years old, a year, you don't really think about that stuff, you know, it's, it's just like, it's, it's something that was there, and it's always been there, you know, in the back of my mind, and then around five, um, well, before that, I started having experiences, uh, I started having a lot of uh, nighttime things going on, and I had an experience that I remember we had woods out beyond our property that uh, me and my brothers and sisters used to go run around in and play during the day. And I remember we had been out there running around and uh, I remember my oldest brother had a teepee that he was building out in the middle of the woods that uh, I remember going and seeing him at the spot where he had the teepee that he was building. And then I don't remember anything really after that. I remember being uh, lost away from everybody in the woods. And um, I was uh, engaged by this being that came around a big oak tree, just kind of leaned around and stepped out. And he was about four feet tall. 
and he had a, a big head and large eyes and is a, like a creamish color complexion the the uh the entities that i'm involved with have a creamish color to them um other people have been that i've been recently talking to describe them as grays and i've always been thrown off by that because my my perception of grays and, and the information that i've read about grays tends to be negative and uh, you know um i have had some some incidences that were traumatic but uh the first experience he steps out um it, said hello to me we were communicating telepathically immediately he just he spoke to me i heard him in my mind and i i thought back to him my response i didn't talk to him um he said hello to me i wasn't frightened by him um i was more interested than anything about why is this strange man in the woods you know dressed weird and was taken aback by his size and everything. And uh, uh, he, he had on a skin tight bodysuit, the hands were uh, to the wrist and the hands were revealed. And then from the, the neck up, uh, their head is, is revealed. Um, large almond shaped eyes. Said he was a scientist, asked if we wanted to be friends. And I said, yes. And he said that we were going to be friends for my lifetime and uh, that he would be seeing me again soon. And he turned and uh, I noticed when he turned then that there was an egg shaped craft that was probably about six feet tall sitting next to him in, in the, I couldn't see it because it was metallic and it was reflecting all the leaves and the bushes and the trees around him. So it just looked like more bushes and trees. And I was really intrigued with this being stepping out saying hello to me i didn't notice this object so a door opened up on it he climbed in the door closed and this thing just zipped up straight up into the sky so that was my first experience with seeing anything or experience anything other than the uh the craft that i saw uh from the crib so my years after that, I was dealing a lot with uh, uh, occurrences where I was having paranormal or, or um, strange uh, occurrences going on in my bedroom at night, shadow beings or, or shadow objects moving around on the floor. I would see these uh, black shadow shapes that looked like the size of a box turtle. I would be sitting up in my bed and I would see them materialize by my one wall and scurry across the floor and then go under my bed. And I was terrified of my closet, which was in direct line of sight from me in my bed, um, because I always imagined um, people coming into my room. People were coming into my room and doing things to me at night and they were coming out of my closet. So, the other thing at that point, I was having uh, what I call falling dreams. I was having these incredible dreams where I would be falling and waking up falling and I would be physically sliding down my bed like I was falling off my bed and uh, it would feel like I had just got slammed into my bed, like I was just getting dropped into my bed and that was happening a lot. I had those dreams a lot. I had a lot of reoccurring uh nosebleeds for no reason. Um, then the occurrence happened when I was, I had a, what I thought was a incredible nightmare when I was seven. Um, that would have been probably 1977. Um, maybe 78. I, I had this dream where, uh, I was on a table and, and I was surrounded by uh, little uh, three, three entities that were about three and a half, four feet tall. Um, they had no, no uh, uh, outfit on or no, no clothing. Um, they were just uh, their body. And, and they, they were, were rushing around doing things. I remember a lot of... Uh, it's, it was hard to get a look around them because it was so bright. There was a, such a bright, bright light above me. And I remember being on a table and there was a being to my right and two on my left hand side that were both, they were all, all three going around doing things. 
and um, I was starting to get frightened and there was a tall being behind me that I call the female and she had a very, very uh, strong female energy or mothering energy from her. Um, the, the drawing with the, with the entity with the device in his hand turned to me and it was a wand in his hand. And then out from the end of the wand, three wires came out that came out straight and then turned into like grasping uh, device. And they stuck that in my left eye and took my eye out of my head and I lost it. And I, the last thing I remember is the, the female was over me and was looking, I'm looking into her eyes um, because she was literally hovering inches from my face. And uh, I was just absolutely terrified. And she immediately was calming me down. Um, I, I consider them like the, the at that point, the, the, looking back at the experience, um, that those are like controllers. They, they, they're in charge of keeping uh, the person calm if there's an experience like that going on. Um, I don't know how it could not be traumatic for somebody if they're having an experience like that, especially somebody at, at that age um, who's having a dream of that. You know, I, I, I had never seen these things before other than the one in the, in the woods. And, and uh, like I said, it was, it was one of those situations where, where uh, it was one of those situations where um, I didn't know what was going on. I immediately, you know, I'm there and I'm coming to in this, in this really, really weird situation. And, um, she immediately just calmed me down when I started to freak out was like, uh, um, you're fine. You're going to be fine. We're not going to hurt you. Everything's going to be all right. And, uh, looking into it, looking into her eyes is just like, it's like falling into, a, a, an abyss. The, the, they look at you and there's nothing that you can't, that you can hide from them that you feel like they are peering into your very soul. They, they know, everything about you when they look at you and there's not judgment or anything like that it doesn't it just feels like the uh, i've called it a, the, that hive mind mentality of there there's a consciousness between them that is going on that uh their awareness is is uh you know they're, they're not doing these things i don't believe they're doing these things to frighten us or to hurt us in any way it's it's part of whatever they 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 have going on on their level of existence, and they're deeply deeply tied to human beings. Did you uh, didn't you say that you they put an implant in your eye? I want to believe that they put something behind my eye. I have a uh, I have a on my eyelid, uh, which you obviously won't be able to see here, but I have a scar, a scoop mark scar on my eyelid, on my left eyelid that I've never ever had anything remotely uh, on my face as far as cuts or blisters or you know anything like that so it's weird to have that there and then um uh the 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 experience then was just more dealing with the the trauma of of remembering it and when i woke up and remembered it you know i had blacked out at the worst possible point so I didn't remember saying anything at that point except waking up the following morning. And how were you, you know, the next day? Um, I was really excited because when we woke up, there was, I, I didn't even really think about the nightmare because once I woke up, I thought about it and it just immediately skipped my mind because uh, my parents had come in to wake me and my brother up and there on the screen by my brother's window were two huge Luna moths that were about the size of the palm of your hand and uh, it was the first time I ever remember seeing those and I just remember it being like a strange strange thing and they were all the my parents were immediately just into looking at the moths and we all four of us were looking at them and then I never really thought about it again after, after that you know it was just like something that happened you know I I didn't I didn't know what to think about it you know I had no basis to relate it against anything. Okay. Did you um, 
if we go back to the the encounter in the woods, did you have? I think you might have had missing time, right? I there there was a, a and again, you know, I'm you're dealing with a five year old running around in the woods. You know, I don't I didn't have a watch on. I wasn't paying attention to time. I remember being out and running around. I remember all of us being together, me and and my two brothers, and and I think my one sister. Um, we all run around doing things in the woods and then I remember going with my brother to the spot where the teepee was and seeing the framework of the teepee that he was working on and then like I said I don't really remember it's foggy from there okay wow. and then I have the I have the memory of this experience which you know it, it wasn't more than a couple of minutes when it happened and then you know after that I mean I had to uh, at the age of six or seven, I was reading books on on NASA and the space program. Any anything that I could get, I was so interested in the stars and astronomy and the space, outer space, and astronauts. Um, growing up, there wasn't there wasn't this whole alien subculture thing going on in the seventies. You know, it was well before, well before any images of greys and all that sort of stuff. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it was something that, that I was, I was feeling like I was being influenced uh, by something else that, that was putting these ideas in my mind. So you, um, okay, so yeah, I've got the drawing with the, uh, the grey with the tool. When did the, uh, the grey with the hoodie, when did that happen? That was probably around age nine. I, w I had a memory. I have a memory. I was sleeping over at a friend's place, and we were. Uh, it was a buddy of mine from elementary school, and he invited me over for a sleepover. And I remember waking up in his room. We were in a, a his bedroom, and and he had uh, he was in his bed, and I was in a bed on the other side of the room. And I remember waking up and being startled by seeing this this very very small being. It was probably only about three feet tall, and it had the hood on. Um, very very fine features. Um, I spooked it, or, or or he spooked me, and we both like. Uh, I, I woke up. He was there, and I, and then it darted off to its left down down about six steps down to the landing into the kitchen and I hopped up immediately and ran after it. My friend was still asleep and I chased it down the steps. I saw it run through the kitchen and then down the basement steps and I followed it down the basement steps and ran into the basements and it was dark and there was there was no lights on and I remember walking into the or running down to the room and, and the thing just disappearing. It wasn't there anymore. Wow. And it was just a brief thing and that was one like that happened and I didn't really have that memory until uh, probably my 20s it surfaced. Did something cause the, uh, the memory to come back? Oh yeah, I mean I have, since I started having what I, I, I had this major experience in, in Florida at the age of 19 in 1989, and that was what I thought was my, or what I considered my first real UFO encounter, um, because I, there, there's so many things that have come to light that I remember, and then other people have even reminded me of. Um, there was an experience that I had in high school that was a very brief sighting, but I was with a girlfriend of mine and uh, her and I had gone up shopping in a neighboring town uh, about 45 minutes north of where I lived. And we were on our way back and it was, it was in the evening and the stars had come out and uh, we saw a glowing green unknown object come across the, the freeway above the treetops, uh, cut across from the right side of the freeway and go across the road. And, you know, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, but then I, I did not remember this experience until I saw my ex-girlfriend who I hadn't visited or seen in many years at that point. And I was home for a vacation for the holiday and I bumped into her and we ended up having a conversation or I explained to her about these things that were going on with me. And she brought up the occurrence of, well, don't you remember seeing the green objects coming back from Toledo when we were in high school? And it was just like, 
immediately the floodgates were open and I had access to the memory then. And I remembered it like, I remember it now, like I have full access to the incident. Like I said, it was very short. Um, it definitely wasn't an aircraft. There was, it was a glowing green uh, UFO shaped, disc shaped object. Uh, just well, it's not the green orb photo. The, uh, would it be uh, the mothership? I'm sorry. Would no, I didn't, draw, I didn't draw the image of the, the, the encounter that we were talking about there. I've had a lot of I've had a lot of things like that where um, um, I had one other experience in high school. Then when I was uh, seventeen or eighteen, I was at a friend's house. We were hanging out at my buddy's place, and and it was me and another good friend of ours, and um, we had been hanging out, and we went outside, and we're hanging out outside, and uh, I remember seeing an object in the in the sky. Uh, an unknown and it was super quick it was just a ma literally a matter of like maybe five seconds uh, this thing appearing and zipping zipping around like just a white light like moving quickly at, at very very strange like zigzag you know and it, it was there I pointed out to my friend he saw it and then it was gone so it's like we had I, I had incidences like that but you know, I never, I, I didn't really think anything about it. You know, I was, I was 18 and I was into partying and, and wanting to just like hang out with my friends, you know, and, and it just didn't phase me. It was like, okay, what was that? Uh, I don't know, you know, and I really didn't, I, I did not get into uh, researching the whole UFO phenomenon until I had this experience in Florida at age 19. And it just threw me through a loop. And I, I, you were talking about questioning your insane, your sanity, you know. And you really start to question your insanity when you have something like that. That that is so. It, it just pushes the boundaries of everything that you can imagine, you know. And then you have the whole doubt: Did this go on? Did this really go on? Because uh, the experience. <clears throat> The, what had happened there is I was on vacation with my, uh, it was my uh, second year of college, and I was on vacation with my parents down in Florida. And uh, two of my friends from college, from Akron, where I went to the university there, were down in Florida, and they called me up and, and said that they were going to come and get me if I wanted to hang out with them, that they were going camping for a night with a couple of girls that uh, my one friend was friends with. And... Uh, do I want to come? So I said, yeah, you know, they came and picked me up. Uh, we drove a couple hours from where I was at to uh, outside of Tampa. And we went to, we were, we were in a, a forest there. I don't know if it was a state park or a national park, but we had gone to this place and met the girls who were already there and they had a camp set up in the campground. A, a typical campground, lots of families, RVs and that. Yeah, we hung out and, and we were all, uh, we all were uh, partying, just having a few uh, beers, and, and uh, uh, we all, there was, there was me, there was my friend Thad, and my friend Steve, and uh, Brenda, and her friend, who I can't remember her name, and uh, I had just gotten introduced to the two girls. I had never met them before. My buddy Thad went to high school with Brenda, and then he met, he had just met the other girl as well. Thad, I don't think, knew either of them as well, so... We we're hanging out, and uh, we uh, I had I had uh, been into utilizing psychedelics at that time, but it was it was not in a abusive way. It was in a more in a uh, 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 experimental, religious, uh, ritualistic kind of way. I would take them and you know meditate beforehand and whatnot, and. I took uh, maybe about a gram and a half, two grams of mushrooms. The girls both dropped acid, and then I think Thad and Steve both were on mushrooms. Well, we hung out for a little while, and we were starting to feel good, and, and the sun was starting to go down, and we didn't want to be around, we didn't want to be around the other, um, all these other families while we were hanging out partying. So Steve had the great idea to, well, let's go, let's go back in the part of, of the, the uh, forest where they, they're, you're not supposed to camp. It was an off limits area. And we went, we went back and found this spot in the, in the woods and moved our camp out there. So it was a really, really cool spot and there was nobody around. And there was a, a beyond in the woods where we were at, there was a pavilion area and, and, um, 
next to that was uh, was a small pond or a lake that had an oriental bridge going over it. So the uh, once we got set up over there, uh, Fad and Steve said that they were going to go for a hike. Did we want to go for a hike through the through the woods? And uh, me and Brenda and her friend decided that we were going to hang out on the bridge. The sun was going down. It was stars were just starting to come out. So Fad and Steve took off. I was hanging out with the girls. It was w was just feeling good, you know, and and was was uh, happy and and having a good time with them. We were just talking and sitting on the bridge, and it was beautiful. And uh, out of nowhere, to my left, a huge owl hoots. It was in the tree to my left, and it hoots and jumps out of the tree and flies across my view um, across the lake over to a neighboring tree on the other side of the the, the path where the uh, bridge goes. So it pops up in a tree and this thing is huge. It looked like it was like three and a half feet tall, okay? Biggest owl I've ever seen in my life, right? And I, I do believe it was, it was uh, 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 what do they call it? They're the largest ones. They have the uh, they have the the uh, feathers that come up on the head like that, and they do the, they have the traditional hoot. So uh, this thing this thing flew across my view, and and I was just amazed by it. And I could tell that those guys saw, it and we we're all we're all three just amazed by this bird, and it goes and lands up in the tree and is looking at us. Well, when it flew across my view. The stars had come out and I noticed this star in the sky that blinked, right? It's, I swear to God, I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, what's going on? This, this star is blinking at me. And you know, I, I would, would had my tracers from the bird and I had my, my normal like patterning going on, like it just like looking through a clear transfer with some color patterning on it you know so it was like it was not like i was imagining a vw bug in front of me that i've explained it that way a lot of a lot of times um never ever have i had a hallucination where i've i've imagined something being there like a volkswagen bug in my living room okay so this star blinks at me and i am watching it and it starts scrolling through colors um every color of the rainbow, red, yellow, blue, green, purple, and scrolling back again. And um, I flashed it with my flashlight. And the girls were like, what are you doing? And I was like, do you see that object? And I pointed at it and they were having a hard time seeing it. So I flashed it again. And this thing just started going ballistic. It's like blinking lights even faster. It zooms forward. And, you know, grew in size, like, very quickly. It just, like, zoomed in on us and was, like, literally uh, right above us in our view. And this thing was huge. I mean, it had to at least be a uh, hundred and some feet across, I would imagine. This thing was big. And it was uh, your atypical saucer brushed aluminum. Um, it had a single aerial coming off the top of it, and it had uh, had the colored lights through the middle section that were strobing, and, and uh, it zoomed in up, up on us. And you know, uh, before that had happened, when when it was when I blinked it and it started blinking all the colors, I was like, "Do you see it now?" And they all were like, "Yeah." And I I didn't say anything. I'm just standing there watching it because I didn't want to influence them by by saying I'm seeing blue right now. But I was like what are you seeing right now? And they start naming off colors and I'm seeing the exact same colors blinking from this object. So we're all, all three standing there just shell shocked. Like, is this really going on? This thing zooms back to where it was and it's just sitting there blinking, doing its thing like it was before and two neighboring stars on either side uh, perfect equidistance from the object, uh, the, the, I called it a mothership because that's what it reminds me of, your atypical mothership. All right, so the, the big control ship, um, uh, these two lights start blinking in the sky and they're equidistance from the, the center ship and they're blinking orange, green, orange, green, orange, green. <laughs> and all of a sudden these two, these two lights just start coming towards us. And I looked over at Brenda and the other girl and I'm like, are you seeing that? And they're like, yeah, you know, and I mean, my hair is standing up on end just telling you the story. You know, I was just in shock 
and uh, I was excited. I was like way excited. I was just like, this is incredible. Um, I was loving it at that point. Well, I ran over the, the edge of the bridge from the center of the bridge to the, the neighboring clearing because this thing was going right over our heads. I ran into the clearing and I was probably 20 feet ahead of the girls. And this object went overhead. It couldn't have been more than, than uh, 100 feet above me. It was about the size of a, of a mid-sized Cadillac and it was a flying perfect pyramid, three-sided triangle. It had, it had uh, lights on all the points, green and orange. And then on the front point, like it flew over top of me and I was looking up and saw it totally silhouetted against the night sky. It was jet black, matte black. Like you couldn't see, it was like you were, you couldn't see that through. It was like you're looking through the object. You couldn't see anything other than black, but you knew you weren't looking at the sky because all the stars were gone. You can see the stars silhouetted around the outscape of the ob object. Well, Orange and, orange and green lights are blinking on this thing and the front cone, uh, the front point of this perfect equilateral pyramid had a spinning silver white light. Like that was one thing I didn't describe about the mothership too. The mothership on the bottom part of it had a white, 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 silver electric white light, like whiter than anything I've ever seen glowing out of the bottom of it. The mothership made a slight hum a, a, a low hum that you heard the other crafts were completely silent that thing flew overhead and uh i was i was just dumbstruck i'm like yeah i knew i wasn't looking at any aircraft you know i'm i'm extremely well versed in in aircraft and knowing what types of aircraft are out there and this was ne definitely this was definitely something that i, I uh, have to perceive as being from somewhere else you know it was it was just amazing so this thing flew overhead and and turned and the other ones of them is in perfect tandem with it they never they never came out of being in locks perfect tandem from each other they were always equidistant from each other and they turned and they cut back in the sky towards the mothership and they were heading towards uh, this clearing on the other side of the woods where this pavilion was. It was on the other side of the bridge. So I immediately get this vibe that the, these things are going to land over in, in the field on the other side. So I go over the bridge. The girls are, are both just standing there like, what is going on? And I'm like, come on, let's go over to the clearing beyond the pavilion because it looks like they're going to land over there. And you know, and I, w I was freaked out, but I was more excited than I was freaked out at that point. You know, I, I, wa I wanted to know what was going on and what these things were. And um, we all agreed to, to go to the, the path through the woods to the by the pavilion. It was, all, it was all shaded in by trees and there was this pathway. And, and when we got to the edge of the pathway, you could see the pavilion to the right and in the center of these groups of trees. And then beyond it, you could see the clearing through the end of the path. Well, we took like three steps down to the path and all of a sudden, it, we just started hearing rustling in the bushes coming from both sides. We stopped dead in our tracks, you know, uh, I looked at, at Brenda, she looked at me, we were all just like, what's that? And as soon as we got quiet and stopped, it got quiet. And I was just like, what do you guys think? And, and Brenda was like, I wanna go back to the clearing. And, and I was like, let's take another couple steps forward and see what happens. And we took one more step forward and it happened again and they took off running and I ran after them. <laughs> so we, we literally ran up over the bridge and into the center of the clearing that was on the other side where the, the drone had flown over me, the, the pyramid. So we all immediately dropped down with our backs to each other, looking in every direction around us. And, and we're just like an animal on edge. You know, we, we flopped down, the mothership was still there, the, uh, the drones went back to where they all were, and they were just blinking back and forth to each other in the, in the uh, sky. Well, we sat there and 
it was really weird. It would get, you know, it would go from being like atypical noise sounds in the woods at night with bugs and, and, you know, birds and all that going on and a breeze to being super still and the perimeter of the bushes uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the trees around the clearing, it was like somebody was turning a dimmer switch. It kept getting darker. It would get darker and everything would get quiet. And we were all paranoid. It felt like something was watching us. And that happened like maybe three or four times. It was coming in, in these phases every couple of minutes. It was happening like that. Well, the objects were still in the sky. And, and uh, I, at that point, I, I, I'm like, I'm going back to the tent because I have my camera there. I was I had a, a art class photo photo. Uh, class and I had a very nice Pentax black and white camera with film in it back at my tent. So I was like, I'm gonna go and, and get the camera. Well, they were sitting in the clearing and were staying there and I, I went to the edge of the clearing to enter the path to the woods to get to our camp. And soon as I stepped onto the path, I heard something coming through the bushes that sounded huge. And it just sounded like something was ripping through the trees, coming right for me. And I heard the most blood curdling, I call it a scream, but it was, it was like no animal or person or anything that I ever heard before in my life. It scared the living life out of me. I turned and ran like a, a little girl, age four, back to my friends in the field and flopped down and literally like the only thing I could think was whatever it was, was going to come through the woods and rip my very soul from my body. It was that terrifying. Was it a and, shrill? Huh? This was real. Right? No, no. Was it a shrill or a form of a shrill? It was. <sighs> You know, I'm not familiar with, uh, other than reading the, these experiences and having met some people in my travels uh, that have had experiences with Sasquatch, but it, it, it reminds me of these screams that I've heard interpretations of, of these, these Sasquatch that people are hunting in the woods. Because, you know, because, you know, because you were talking about that, you know, that strange sound, and when my girlfriend and I, before we, we, we think we got abducted, because we had the same experience, you know, the same night before we met. And uh, both of us heard sh high shrieking sounds when we try to communicate with it. And uh, so I sort of connected with what you said. And, you know, it might be different because, you know, who knows what it is, but it's, it's still freaky. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a big time into outdoors and animals and things like that, you know, and nature documentaries. I mean, I, it did sounded like nothing. Nothing I would imagine uh, coming out of out of the woods in Florida, you know, I mean, it, it, I can't describe it. It was just literally like scared me to my core. Uh, and and it, uh, you know I I I had no I, I was not expecting that. You know, it like it I ran, flopped down. All three of us were sitting there just like terrified. And, and this thing was still coming through through this, the trees. I had immediately flopped down. We were hill still on the noise, like this ripping and just branches. And this thing's coming forward. And right when it sounds like it's gonna come out the edge of the branch of the trees, it stops. The darkness kicks back up to light. The birds start chirping. And then um, Thad and Steve come walking out of the woods. And they're like, what are you guys doing? And, and all three of us were just like, you're never going to believe what's going on, you know? So we started telling them what was going on, me and Brenda. And, and we were all just like explaining them what we had seen. And my, my friend Steve's ex-Air uh, Force, he ex-Air Force pilot. And uh, he, he just looked at us and was just like, you guys are just messed up. You're, you're, you're high and, and you're looking at airplanes thinking that they're UFOs. And right then when he says that, uh, a, a 747 flies by, you know, and I look up and I see the thing and it, it's an airplane. You can hear the airplane. You can see the, the colored strobe. You can see the white strobe. You know, I'm like, I'm not going to live this one down, you know, and then the, the, uh, we, you know, we explained to them about the rustling and about the noise and, and 
uh, Sad says, oh, well, we, when we were hiking in the woods, we ran into armadillos. Those were armadillos that you heard rustling around in the in the bushes. And, you know, I, I know there, there were armadillos out there, but I don't know if it was the armadillos going on or, you know, that, that it could have been armadillos. And that was part of our head at that point from seeing these things that we were bugged out thinking that there were actually creatures or whatever. I mean, at that point, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea what I was looking at. And uh, to this day, I mean, I haven't talked to her in many years, but I, I talked to her probably about seven years ago. And Brenda still has the exact same story, word for word verbatim, and asked me, you know, like, what do you think that was that we heard? And I still to this day do not have a clue. Wow. There's, a, there's a huge uh, connection between uh, owls and UFOs. Yes. A good friend of mine, Mike Clellan, he's an experiencer and he wrote a book exactly on that. I just read his second book, um, Waiting on the, on the First Book, Messengers. I just read the companion book. I finished that uh, actually this morning. Really? Wow. Yes, he is a fantastic book. And I have had other really crazy owl experiences. Um, the owl is one of my totem animals. Uh, so is so is the uh, raven or crow. And uh, I, uh, red-tailed hawk is, is mine. I see red-tailed hawks, uh, uh, and I live here in the city. I have one in my neighborhood here that I see almost daily. And my son and I, whenever him and I are together, I, we always see two two hawks, red-tailed hawks, whenever we're together. Like if we go hiking in the woods, we almost it's almost guaranteed we're going to run into two red-tailed hawks if we're together in the woods. And I had a crazy experience with a giant owl and a crow that were traveling in tandem that encountered me when I was uh, over in these woods back behind an apartment complex back in... Uh, Oh, it must have been 2008. And uh, I had been going back to this area of the woods to, to meditate and get away from everything and be in nature. And I found this area that was by this creek that, that somebody had a fire and it looked like they had like some, some sort of, uh, it was a place where, where they hung out and were doing some type of uh, uh, positive uh, like Wiccan magic that I just felt. You know, and I was back in there and I, and I was just hanging out and uh, all of a sudden this this huge owl with a crow right and a big, big crow right next to it swoops down and, and the, I, I swear to God, it, it almost touched my head. It was that close to me that it, and, and it was pro its wingspan. It was probably about three and a half, four feet wingspan. And this thing is flying at my height, which is six foot. Three, it just comes ripping through the trees and it's got a giant raven with it and they're flying next to each other. And they're supposed to be, because I went and looked it up afterwards, the raven and owls are supposed to be uh, enemies of each other, okay? So here are my two totem animals traveling in tandem with each other, almost hit me on my head, and I chased them through the woods for probably like eight minutes. I ran following, I don't know how far I ran, it was a ways. I mean, I chased this, this giant owl and the crow until they, they, uh, I lost track of them. And, and uh, it, it was many, you know, it was probably, like I said, about eight minutes through the woods that I had them in sight. And they were flying just at like seven feet off the ground through the woods. It was the most amazing thing. And uh, I don't know what to think about that. You know, I don't know what to think about it, especially after having the experience in Florida with it starting with the owl. And then, yeah, his, his book is very interesting, and he has a lot of people that have had similar experiences with the owl. Well, I, and, I suspect uh, that if, it, if the owl would have standed in front of you, like you know, standing three, four feet tall, you know, that could have been a projection, you know, from yes. a grave, which yes. you know, usually happens, but uh, who knows, really? You've yeah, got, I mean, um, yeah. you said that you had um, a Native American blood as well. Yes, um, my great, 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 great grandmother was Anne Suncloud. She's the daughter of the chief of the Lenape tribe out of New Jersey. Um, she married a white guy, uh, Tom Luker, who was the ferryman um, up in, in the area at that time. And uh, Tom's River, New Jersey is named after him. So yeah, I have a, I am a direct descendant of, of Anne Suncloud. Um, and uh, 
I think that that has a lot to do with it and a lot to do with my, uh, uh, well, everything going on with the, with the encounter experience, I think is tied to that. Um, type O negative blood. Um, I have the Native American situation going on. I think that that, well, it definitely has opened me up to, uh, uh, since I started learning about my history and really gaining a better understanding on it and, and uh, getting into uh, reading more about the star people, because that's what I call them. I don't like to, the word alien. Um, it's always disturbed me. Um, I think that it's just a very negative connotation and they're, they're people just like us. Um, they're just from a, a different civilization and a different universe than us, you know? So once I started researching my Native American uh, links to the star people and whatnot, I started to realize that, you know, um, this, this stuff goes way back with, with the Native Americans. You know, they've been having contact with the star people right along and they call them the star nation. And there's a wide range of civilizations that they've been in contact with. And the star people or the uh, Native Americans don't normally talk to any other people about their star people experiences. I had read a book at the time by uh, RD6 Killer Clark. Um, I had seen her on Ancient Astronauts or Ancient Aliens on History Channel. And, and I really liked what she had to say when I saw her on the show. And she did a book called Encounters with Star People. So I seized it out and uh, it was a very incredible book. It's probably one of the most influential books I've ever read on the subject. And the sightings are direct stories that she has gotten word, word of mouth from a fellow Native American. She's traveled all across the US to get people's stories. I forget how many years it took her to compile the stories for the first book. I actually had communicated with her back in 2015. I reached out to her after I read the book and her and I were communicating with each other back and forth uh, for a little while there. And then I lost contact with her. My email got shut down at that email address and I ended up losing contact with her. Um, but she ended up writing a second book, Encounters with Star People 2. And that one is very, very different from the stories in the first one. The first one, um, the, the stories are just incredible in regards to the positivity in the accounts of these, these incredible stories, um, sh accounts of shape-shifting, and the whole thing with uh, the, what you were discussing about the owl and uh, supposedly uh, 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 Clellan suggests that uh, deer are also cover images and uh, having read his book I had a really strange experience last fall um, and I hadn't been like last year I wasn't out uh, looking for contact and I wasn't looking out at the stars like I used to uh, every night or anything like that um, I had one encounter of uh, of the, the light that flashed me that I was telling you about. Um, it showed up in, it last, last May when I was living out in Kent. I was living in a guy's house uh, because I had, I had been uh, uh, in the same with a different friend and I moved in with this guy because I needed a place to stay. I'd met him in a group and um, I had just gone to get food and the stars had come out and I, when I would come back, I did my little meditation when I was going in and they showed up, light showed up and flashed me and, and I flashed it back with my lighter and then it flashed me again and took off. And that was the only encounter I had last year that I remember, but then I had this experience with the deer. Um, it was the second I was asleep my room was upstairs and I, I had uh, I had woken up and I was it was my second experience with uh, sleep paralysis. I woke up and I, I couldn't move. I'm laying in the bed, couldn't talk, couldn't move. Definitely sensed the presence in the room, but there was nothing that I could see in the room, but I could not move. And this this was like that for a man. I was there trapped in that for a good couple of minutes laying there, not being able to move, not being able to speak. I could not lift my arms. I couldn't move a pinky. It felt like I was cement. And uh, when I was able to come out of it and sit up, I remember getting out of the bed because I didn't know if it was an encounter or if it was sleep paralysis. And I remember walking to the window to look outside and when I did, I looked out to the street and I mean, I'm on, I'm in, a, in a, 
cl real close to downtown Kent. You know, we're college town, uh, people, cars, it's all over the places, houses, residential area, three giant female does were walking down the street right after that. You know, I, I went and I, I looked out the window and I'm like, wow, that's really odd. And they all three looked up at me and I looked at them and then they just trotted right on back of the house. And I didn't think anything of it. I went back to bed. And then, you know, having read his book and, and looking back on it, it triggered me when I read his book. I'm like, um, I think that might have been something, you know. Because at that point, I was not, uh, I was not actively wanting to engage uh, with what had been going on. I, I had reached a point where I, I had a lot of heavy things in my life I was dealing with at the time and had, had gotten uh, sober. I had uh, problems with alcohol uh, on and off in my life. And I think a lot of that has to deal with the trauma and the post-traumatic stress that you go through with all this. Um, so I was, I had gotten sober at that point and, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't out star watching like I was during the height of, of my experiences. After the experience in Florida in 1992, I was age 22. I went out to a rainbow gathering in Colorado. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the rainbow family. Um, the rainbow family, uh, started after Woodstock, uh, when Woodstock, uh, wrapped up and the people that were there that had traveled all across the country, the, the hippie family that were, were tied into the, the Grateful Dead family out in California, they were known as the, the Rainbow family. And uh, a lot of uh, people from communes and things like that. And the Rainbow family does national gatherings all across the world on the week of July 4th. And I went out to my first national, which was out in Colorado. And I went out there with two friends of mine from Akron and had some incredible encounters out there. Um, literally like 30,000 people out in the most gorgeous spot in, in pristine nature, Colorado. Um, huge valley with mountains and a giant lake. And uh, we, had, we had gone there to gathering and uh, the first day that we were there, we were hiking in and uh, I got separated from my friends and it was a good couple mile hike in and I was carrying all my, all my equipment and my camping gear and everything, a big backpack. So I was having a hard time with the, uh, with the elevation. I'd never been out west to that type of elevation. So I was having a hard time breathing and whatnot, hiking in. So I was taking frequent breaks. I got separated from them. I ended up spending the first day and a half without them. I wandered into the gathering and right when I got into the main valley where everyone had gathered for main circle, um, they have a center pole there and that's, that's where people will, will go down to meet and that's where the drum circles are. So there was a raging drum circle going on and then they had to open up the gathering. They had everybody join hands across the valley in a circle over this vast valley, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And we're all out there just praying for peace, you know, and, and uh, just amazing experience. And when night fell, I ended up going up the hillside because I had left all my stuff there, just flopped it on the ground and was hanging out and went and grabbed my stuff, went up the hillside and found a nice spot to, to make a camp. Well, I was ha struggling trying to put up this six person pole tent by myself. And uh, these two guys, I, I asked them, they were by me and I said, hey, can you help me out? And they came and helped me out. And there's a couple of nice guys from uh, uh, Georgetown, Washington, DC. And uh, uh, Kevin and uh, Jim. And I was hanging out with them after they helped me with the tent and we were sitting around the fire and we witnessed a red orb up in the sky. I mean, it was a gorgeous setting. You'd look at the sun had, had gone down and the stars were out. It was completely dark and the valley was just uh, campfires all across the valley and lightning bugs. It was, it was magical. And we were sitting there talking and I looked up into the sky and I was looking at the stars and this red orb appeared in the sky and was just, it looked like somebody had scribbled on a piece of paper, you know? I'm like, what's that? And I pointed it out to them next to me and they both caught it and we were watching it. It was there for a couple of minutes and it just disappeared. So, 
I, I had made a comment to my, I, I said, uh, uh, um, I think that's, those are our, our brothers and space brothers and sisters. And he says, I think you're right. And I ended up uh, taking off after hanging out with them for a little while. I went down to go down to the main circle. And I ended up meeting, had meeting this girl by the fire where my camp was, and she had a little baby. And I walked her down to the main circle, and we went to a fire, and we're hanging out with a bunch of people around this fire. And I was hey, sitting there playing with the baby and was, was looking up at the sky, and damned if I didn't see this red orb again, just scribbling through the sky. And the baby, she was probably like nine months, and I know that they're not supposed to be able to see very far, but this... I saw the thing because I saw her attention. She turned and looked that direction and I saw the thing again and uh, it just disappeared. So then I hung out there for a little while and uh, um, ended up uh, going back up to my camp and, and sleeping. Got up the next morning, went to main circle, hooked up with my friend Matt and Mary, the, the, the couple that I had come from Akron with we had drove out together so I found out where their camp was set up they were down by the lake over in this uh, section of woods um, in, in the picture if you look at the picture of the lake it's the section of, of deep fir trees on the left of the lake um, I went there I set up my camp I hung out with them for a while during the day and then when night came along um, uh, me and Matt had decided we were going to go down to the drum circle. He wanted to borrow my my drum, and I had that from a girlfriend of mine that wasn't there at the gathering, and I let him borrow it, but I said, you know, if you're going to take her drum, you can't lose it, you know, because she'll kill me, and um, here, tie this green glow stick to it. So I cracked a green glow stick, brand new, tied it to the drum, gave it to him. Him and I walked off to the main circle, and uh, Mary stayed back at the camp. So we separated at Main Circle, Matt and I. He went to do, go drum, and I went, went wandering around. And I started seeing uh, objects when I was walking through the valley, uh, just enjoying the, the people in the circle and everything. Um, there, were, there were objects flying around that looked like airplane, but were giving off no airplane sounds. They had blinking lights on them. You know, and they were moving slow, though. You know, a little bit slower than like a Cessna would. You know, and you, you, if, if you were, these things were flying around, you, you, there would have been some engine noise, you know, so no noise. I'm seeing these things and I'm like, I'm questioning myself. I'm like, is this, what am I seeing? You know, is that a UFO or is that an airplane or, or you know, at that time it was well before drones. So it wasn't anything like that. 1992. So, uh, I had been wandering around and seeing these things and they were just like, circling around the valley there was like three of them four of them moving around and, and i i decided to go back to the to the uh camp and i went walking down main trail and i ended up uh getting getting lost i couldn't find where where i needed to take the trail off to the right to go to the lake to find the camp i knew where i was at once i found the lake but i couldn't find the lake so I ended up sitting on, uh, on a rock off the side of the trail for a little while until a couple of people came by and I ended up meeting this guy and this woman from New Zealand. A guy was probably around that time, like I said, I was in my 20s, I was 22. This guy was probably in his mid 20s, 24, 25. And uh, he was with a, a middle-aged woman. Uh, she didn't speak a lick of English. He spoke some English. I could you know, at least communicate with him. And I said, you know, can you guys, take me to Krishna Lake. I'm going to the lake and I'm trying to find my camp. They said, yeah, we're heading that way. Come with us. So they were walking in front of me and I was a couple feet behind them. And I asked them, I said, uh, you know, have you seen anything strange this evening as far as lights in the sky or anything? And they were like, oh no, what are you talking about? And I pointed it out to the guy. I said, do you see that? And, you know, this object's on the other side of the range above the trees and it's coming along, no noise, same blinking lights, you know, like it's trying to look like an airplane. And um, I point that out and he said, oh, that's an airplane. So I didn't say anything, I'm, uh, but all my alarms are going off. All my alarms are like, that is, that is definitely not an airplane. I've been watching these things now for like an hour or two and, you know, I'm, I'm not getting an airplane. And, 
As soon as we got to the lake, the lake is up on the uh, off to the path on the right hand side, and it's a huge lake and a gorgeous, you know, stars reflecting off of the perfect placid lake. The blinking lights coming across the the valley, and I'm still watching it. And right when we get to the lake, there's three of them in the sky in a perfect in a perfect triangle, blinking to each other. The, the fourth one comes in and, and stops in a perfect diamond shape in the sky. And they all start blinking back and forth to each other, just same like, just like the mother ship to the drones. All blinking back and forth, ballistic. The, the one that last, formed the last point in the diamond on the right grew to a light the size of the moon, flashed, like darted across the center of the diamond, flashed and lit up the whole freaking sky. And the woman just starts jumping up and down going do you see this do you see this she's grabbing my arm and i'm like yeah i've been seeing it all night and right then the other three broke formation two of them went off to the west and one came around to the east and headed back towards the the, the routine of going on over the uh ridge by the trees and we hung out there for a minute, you know, and they were, this lady, like I said, went nuts for a couple minutes and, and, and I was just laughing because I was like, I felt validated because, okay, here's two total strangers and this woman who can't even speak a lick of English is, is jumping up and down and shaking me. You know, I know that I saw that. That was real. I mean, and it was like seeing something out of a Steven Spielberg movie, you know, in real life. You're just like, wow, was that real? You know, so I was riding that rush of that experience and I walked back to my camp and uh, um I went to the camp and uh, no one was there. The fire was going. I ended up uh, uh, sitting by the fire and stoked it up for a few and had to go to the bathroom and relieve myself. So I walked over towards maybe a hundred feet towards the, the edge of the trees by the lake. So the lake's behind me and I'm looking up at these, these big fir trees and I'm, I'm peeing and this giant, well, I shouldn't say giant because it was it was big for an orb. This thing was about the size of a medium-sized beach ball, you know, a little bit larger than a basketball. And uh, this giant electric green, silent, beautiful orb just comes slowly gliding over the tops of the trees, and it comes right over my the, my, the, my head up at the very top of the tree, and comes down below the tree line like three feet and bobs up and down like it's checking me out and i'm observing it just like blown away looking at it and it's just like i mean this thing was i i told you when we were having the conversation this one's my favorite that out of everything i've seen there's just something about this green orb that i'm very very drawn to um it took off then it just i mean it just flew off nice and smooth and graceful the way it did when it showed up no noise nothing no no contact of any sort other than it visually i went back to the tents i laid down to go to sleep i fell asleep immediately i woke up sometime after i don't know how long it was maybe an hour hour and a half maybe two i woke up it was still night out I see a glowing green light outside of the tent when I rolled over. Well, I don't know why I didn't think of the orb right away, having just seen it before I went to bed and being so blown away by it. But I immediately thought, oh, it's Matt coming back with my drum. It's the green glow from the glow stick. I rolled over and I went right back to sleep. Well, I woke up the next morning and I went out to the fire and Mary was up. And she says, how was your night? And I said, oh, I had a great night. Wait until I tell you about the things that I saw. And she said, well, I have something to tell you first. She said, I woke up in the middle of the night and came out to the fire. And she was getting up to go to the bathroom. And she said, my tent was pulsating, that there was a green light inside my six person pole tent with just me in there. And the whole tent, she said, was glowing and pulsating this green light and uh i don't remember any of it i don't remember any of it and that 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 one was just like that was the clincher for me because like when florida happened 
you know, I had the, the questions of like, okay, you were on a, a couple of grams of mushrooms. Maybe that had some effect on what was going on. So you start doubting yourself. And like I said, I didn't really, really know anything about UFOs at that point. So when I went back from the Florida experience back to Akron, where I was going to college, I immediately went to the library and checked out a stack of books. Like I went to the, the card catalog and I started looking up all these different titles for books. And literally every book that I looked up, and there was probably 12 of them, every book was in a section in the uh, library of uh, two shelves that big. Every catalog number of it, 12 different books that I saw from UFOs to pyramid power um, were, were in the same section on the shelf in the library, which I thought was incredibly odd. And I ended up taking all these books out and then I started reading them. And, you know, a book that I would think that I'm reading about, I've got the pyramid power book because I'm drawn to the fact that I'm, I'm saw these pyramids, these flying pyramids and the triangle, you know, being a repeat repetitive pattern in the experiences. So uh, I was drawn to that book. I read that book and then lo and behold, they're talking about UFOs in a book about pyramid power. And, and all the books started to link up like that. They might've been completely off subject, but every one of them would mention UFOs at some point in the book. So I started to have these experiences and we started to research on stuff because I literally wanted to know whether I was losing my mind. Was I actually having these experiences and is this real? because I, I didn't put too much weight on the experiences that I had grown up because I was so young and the memories are just like, I remember them, but I don't, I, you know, like the, the experience with the abduction with the eye getting taken out, you know, that was a lucid experience and, and I don't remember much of it. And I don't, I, I don't put a lot of weight on it in regards to a situation compared to like the Florida sighting or the Colorado sighting, where I have no question that I saw what I saw and I experienced what I experienced. I was completely sober in Colorado. I don't even think I had smoked pot the first couple of days that I was there, you know, and I was seeing things with complete strangers, you know, who were verifying what I was seeing. You know, I wasn't leading them in any way. I, uh, like I said, I was very open in regards to, uh, I, I know the subject freaks people out. And when, when I met the people from New Zealand, I knew what I was seeing, but I, I wanted to get their take on it because they were able to see it right then. And then to see what happened with, with the, the sighting over the lake was, like I said, there's there's no way. I mean, there, there, to me, there's no question. We do not have any technology to do anything remotely close like to that. The things that I've seen and I've learned through all of this, um, throw you, you you have to throw our understanding of physics out the window. That they uh, I have had experiences with missing time twice in my life. I had the abduction experience that I talked to you about, and I had an hour and 45 then. I had an experience driving home from college one weekend to visit my parents and I made this drive religiously like at least once or twice a month my first couple years of college. And this was probably my second year of college and I was coming home and it was in the middle of the afternoon, you know, probably like 4, 4.30 in the, in the afternoon. And uh, I, from Akron, it was a straight shot from 224 all the way over to Finley where I grew up. And I came to, or it was like coming out of a dream or waking up and I was awake. So I don't know what I was waking up from. I was sitting at a, a railroad crossing on a road I'd never been on before in my life, looking at surroundings that I didn't, I didn't know where I was. And I immediately pulled over to the first gas station that I was at and I got out of my car and I went into the gas station and I, I grabbed a map off of the, the rack and opened it up to find out where I was at. And I was 35 miles out of my way east off of 224, someplace that I'd never, ever been to in my life. Don't know what happened. Now I had another... <laughs> I had an experience where it was the opposite. Have you ever heard of uh, anybody uh, Godspeed? Have you heard the people say Godspeed? Godspeed be with you or, okay. Well, Godspeed is the opposite. We, I had an experience with a buddy of mine. I was a, I was a techno DJ, DJ all through the nineties and I had a DJ partner 
that him and I traveled around, him and his girl had a laser that they did laser lights at parties and him and I would DJ and we traveled a lot together for, for parties. And I lived in Cincinnati at that time and I played a lot in Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, which is an hour and a half away, Louisville, Lexington, which were both an hour and a half away from Cincinnati, Columbus, hour and a half. So I, I was always traveling with my friend, uh, Jim, and uh, he was big into the UFO thing. And that was one of our things when we when we first linked up. It was the love of the music thing and the the ET thing. And uh, at that time, you know, the the whole ET thing was that was becoming a big in the in the mid '90s. That was when it started to percolate through the subculture in regards to like your stuffed animal behind you with the gray, you know, becoming a cultural uh, symbol. You know, so. Him and I traveled with a buddy of ours that we met from New York and me, him, whenever me, him, uh, he's deceased now, a good friend of mine. He was from New York. His name's Vince. Um, me and Vince and Jim, whenever we went to Indiana, we saw ships like, and I didn't draw any pictures of them for you or anything because it's just like, uh, this would happen and they would be just quick things. And I re would remember, we would remember seeing these things, but I don't have any memory of if there was ever any missing time or anything like that. But we would have encounters with, I, I remember seeing some very large craft with multi lights, just like something that looked like a, out of uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, the movie. And that was that was happening going on there in the 90s and then this was probably 1996 i think me and his girl went up to a party for new year's up in cleveland from cincinnati and cleveland from cincinnati is a three and a half hour drive if you're driving you know the speed limit or five or ten miles over the speed limit and traffic's good you know three and a half hour drive you can make it 315 if you really are pushing it you know speeding we made we left that morning it was easter morning because jim i remember wanted to get back to his mom's house for easter and i had nothing to go back to and we'd been up all night and uh we piled into the car and his his wife kelly was in the back seat and then um I was in the front seat and she fell asleep and right before I fell asleep I made sure Jim was all right with driving and was doing good and I looked at the clock uh, on the on the radio before I nodded out of sleep in the car. Well I woke up and we were we were pulling into the outskirts of Cincinnati and I looked at the clock and only two hours and 20 minutes had gone by. So I'm looking at the clock. I just woke up. I'm just like, I know I looked at that clock and I know what time it was when I looked at it. I look at Jim and I said, man, something weird's going on. I said, have you been aware the whole time while you've been driving? And he said, well, I kind of, I kind of don't remember anything uh, after Columbus. <laughs> so he has a jog in his memory while I'm asleep and she's asleep in the car. And we drove from the heart of downtown Cleveland to Cincinnati, right into town in two hours and 20 minutes. So somehow we shaved an hour off of our time. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, he, he had a foggy memory of, of driving and I was asleep and I woke Kelly up and I asked her if she remembered anything and she didn't remember anything. And both of us to this day, like, you know, I, we don't know what to think about it. I, I've read uh, some other encounters where some stuff like that has happened. They definitely, they, time does not affect them in any way, shape or form. They are able to manipulate time, how we view it, um, like that. <laughs> but normally when there's an abduction, there's missing time. Because we're not aware of, of, you know, of what's happening. So we... Now there is a there's a huge you know time gap between when you were taken when you wake up, but in your case it's totally the opposite, which is not a normal. Uh, you know I've I've written uh, I've I've read certain accounts about on that, but it's it's somewhat rare. Yeah, I mean compared to the normal time. Time. Yeah, and when when I had the experience where I was conscious and abducted off of my porch in 2016 over in Ellet when I was living by the airfield, um, I lost an hour and 45 minutes 
from the time, that? huh? Can you get into that? Do you want me to follow the uh, timeline that we're moving on in regards to the, the, cause I mean, I had sightings between them, but as far as I've never had, uh, and, and this is one of my most, uh, to me, it's one of my most important experiences because I have so many questions from it. Um, let me give you a, uh, I'll give you a brief update for that, for that time span, okay, up to that point. So, um, after I graduated college, um, or actually when I went, when I was, this was after, uh, I graduated college in, this was before the, the 90s, uh, in, I graduated college in December of 93, and I went out west and I lived out of my car uh, as uh, basically just, a, a, you know, hippie, uh, done with college, I'm going to go roam around, um, went to New Mexico and had hooked up with some people and was traveling around out there. I had an experience out there uh, with, with a, a buddy of mine, uh, uh, was up at the ski basin on the top of the mountain outside of Santa Fe, which is in the National Forest in New Mexico. And I had been living up there out of the, up in the forest, out of my car, and then had a campsite up there. Well, we, we had gone up to the top of the ski basin to hang out for the night. We had an experience up there. And then, um, I had the experiences with uh, the ships in Indiana whenever we went to Indiana. And then um, I had a crazy experience in uh, 97 with uh, a bit of gang stalking and my first experience with a uh, black helicopter flying over me. And um, then after after I had almost died in 2013, I had uh, some crazy health issues happened. My cecum, which is your colon on, on your right side, flopped over and I had a complete system shut down. I ended up having to go to the emergency room and was in the hospital for two and a half weeks. Uh, I had emergency surgery two days later, almost died. They had to remove a section of my colon on that side. A month later, after uh, I had recovered to some degree, um, they went back in and took my sigmoid colon out, which is on the other side. Um, and I have a whole bunch of health issues, but uh, I was on the edge of uh, I was on the edge of death for a couple of months. Like when I got out of the hospital, I forced them to let me go. The doctor did not want me to leave at that point, and I, I had been there for two weeks, and I felt like if I was going to stay, I was going to die, and. Uh, I got out of there and um, after the near death experience is when I had, I had moved out. I had just moved into my place over in Ellet, which is by the airfield, um, Akron airfield, uh, where the blimp hangar is and there's a Lockheed Martin facility there as well. So this was, this was literally um, uh, a stone's throw from my, my, apartment in a duplex there. I lived uh, uh, um, five houses up the street from where you could directly across the street from the airfield. And I started having a lot of experiences uh, starting the, the winter and fall of 2013 and progressing up until uh, I had an experience in 2015 where um, at that point, I had gotten into, I was telling you, I had read uh, R.D. Six Colors Clark's book, and then I had read a book by, uh, it's called Black Elk, uh, Sacred Ways of the Lakota by Wallace Black Elk. And that book really affected me and gave me a lot of information, as I said, in regards to the Native Americans' viewpoint on, on the star people. And I knew all this stuff had been going on with me, and I consciously reached out to these these beings and uh, basically I, I said if we're going to continue with this and we're going to keep doing this this situation that I I obviously have agreed to at some point that this I believe that this is a, an agreement between me and and them and that I'm here uh, regardless of how much I hate it sometimes to uh, be here to witness. I'm an observer. That's the only thing that I've ever gotten from them in regards to like a role here is that I'm an observer and that's the, the idea in regards to the, the issue with the, I've had people suggest that the eye thing was a camera. 
that was some type of recording device that was put into me that they're able to attach something to the retina of your eye on the back of your eye and they're able to see through me basically and i don't know if that's true or not but it definitely would make sense um they they find me wherever i go um, I've had experiences in a lot of different places, Colorado, New Mexico, Florida, Ohio, Indiana, they, they, they know where I'm at when, you know, there's nothing that I can do if I wanted to stop it. So, I mean, I just, I made the conscious decision in 2015 after reaching this point that I'm like, okay, I know this is going on. You need to, you need to work with me on, and with the fact that I want to become a conscious participant. If you're going to keep taking me against my will and you're going to come and grab me and you're going to block out my memories of the experience and I'm only going to remember bits and parts, um, I'm not happy with that if that's how it's going to continue. I, 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 it's extremely stressful. Um, you know, being involved in this where, where it's like you, you, there's no choice in the matter, you know. And I don't feel threatened by the experience, but I don't like the fact that uh, I'm like they're they're keeping things from me, you know, or or I'm not allowed to understand the bigger picture when I want to understand the bigger picture, you know. So in 2015, I was doing these meditations, and I'd never heard of CE5 or anything like that. I heard of CE5 uh, after seeing uh, Dr. Greer's disclosure and, and the serious movie, and then him releasing CE5. It was really the first time I started to hear about CE5. And, uh, you know, I did my own thing. I would, I, would, uh, I would always just, like, go out and look at the stars. And when I want, went out to look at the stars, I would call on the Great Spirit, and then I would ask the star people to come down. You know, and I'd go out and it'd be a beautiful night out and I'd have a smoke. I would, you know, sit out there on the porch and look at the stars. And I started having regular contact with orbs and and uh, these things that I call blinkers, which people say look like shooting stars coming in. To me, they look like craft coming, cutting into our atmosphere. And I've seen them where they appear like that, where you see a flashing light cutting in that looks like a shooting star, but it's coming in directly horizontal with the, uh, with the uh, uh, vanishing point on the horizon, you know? It's not your atypical shooting star. And it's only for a certain length, uh, you know, a couple inches in the sky that it travels across and, and like just blinks out. Well, then I, I have seen them where they've cut in like that, where I'm already observing two uh, star-like craft moving around in the sky and a third one or in a fourth one I've seen come cutting in like that. And then, then they appear as a star in the sky moving around with the other ones. So I was having a lot of experiences with that and um, was out on my porch in 2015. It was in June and uh, this light came down and blinked me. I was looking at, uh, at uh, objects in the sky, and then uh, out of nowhere, this light came down, and I was sitting on the porch, and it flashed me. And I pulled out my keychain out of my pocket because I had a little LED keychain, and I blinked it back with my little blinking LED light. And I blinked it, and it blinked me back. And I flashed it again, and it came down right over my neighbor's uh, roof. I was in a duplex and they were in the duplex in front of me and it was literally like, uh, it was probably 25 feet away from me over the roof. And I was sitting there in the chair and I'm blinking it. And it, it, every time I blinked it, like I blinked it three times, it blinked me three times. I blinked it twice then, it blinked me twice back. The light hovered there above the roof and communicated with me like that for a total of five minutes. And I, I was just amazed, man. I, that was, to me, that was just like, okay, this is, there's no way. I'm definitely dealing with a non-human intelligence of some sort because this thing is communicating with me. You know, I wasn't having any, seeing any entities. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't having a large craft or anything like that. And this was just a light and, and, uh, when it blinked, when it pulsed me the second time, you know, I don't know. I, I know you've probably seen videos of what I'm talking about, right? Right. So, you know how they do that. I mean, I, when they flashed me the second time, whatever it was, I felt like they were 
they were hitting me with information. Like they were just, they had just pulsed a bunch of stuff to me. And I don't know what that was about. And uh, it came down, we had our conversation and then it, it took off. Well, 2016, um, I have an experience with the light coming back. And uh, the bef before the light came back was when I had the experience over the airfield. Do you want me to explain that one first or do you want me to go into the abduction experience? How about the, the time that you did uh, a C5 on your porch, on your patio and... And they abducted me. Yeah. And that's okay. That's 2016. So, or are you talking about the ship over the airfield? No, the, you, you, you blacked out and you woke up. On the okay. So 2016 uh, in June, I, I mean, I was having a, a whole bunch of activity. The, the, for some reason, the activity for me um, starts in uh, uh, end of May, beginning of June, and then usually uh, it is slowing down by uh, the uh, end of October, beginning of November. For some reason, there's not much activity in the winter for me here as far as uh, uh, witnessing of craft or orbs or anything like that. Um, I don't have any clue from my research or anything what that, why that is, but uh, I've talked to other people and they seem to think that that's actually what, the, what their opinion is, that, is that there's a lull and there's a peak um, during certain times of the year. So uh, I had been having a lot of encounters and uh, it, was, it was becoming like an almost nightly occurrence. I told you I, was go I would have these experiences and I would immediately go inside and mark down the, the time that I was witnessing it and what I witnessed on my calendar. And I did that for two years, the year of 2015 and 2016. And the summer of 2016 in June, um, I had gone to bed with my son and uh, he had fallen asleep and I woke or I got up uh, maybe 15 minutes after he had fell asleep. And I looked at the clock and it was 10, 15 at night. I, uh, I had a cigarette already rolled. I went outside to, to smoke it. I had enough uh, uh, tobacco inside for one more cigarette. So I went outside, I sat down in the chair, I did my meditation, was smoking the cigarette and the light showed up again. Well, it exact, came over to the exact same spot over here to the left of me and flashed me and I flashed it back and then it disappeared. And I was looking at the stars. It was a gorgeous night. It was clear. I had no other uh, objects in my sight or anything going on. Uh, I finished my cigarette. I immediately got up inside, uh, got up and went inside and rolled the last cigarette because I was excited having seen the light return. And I wanted to go back out and, and see if it would come back. Well, I went back out immediately after rolling the cigarette and sat back down in the chair, lit the cigarette. And then the next thing I remember is coming to, and I'm on my neighbor's porch, which is in my duplex. It's just my, it's in the same building. It's just right next door to me, you know, 10 feet next door. And I'm standing on their porch instead of my porch. And I'm facing the opposite direction to the south, looking over the roof. And there's a giant white light zipping off into the sky like super quick, just taking off. And I'm coming to waving at this light, <laughs> waving goodbye at the light. And I walked over to my porch. I felt like I was on drugs, like no drug that I've ever felt in my life before. And uh, I felt like I was underwater. I didn't know my name. I didn't know who I was, where I was at. I walked into the living room. I'm like, what's going on? And I walked into the bedroom and an hour and 45 minutes had gone by. Wow. And the following morning is when my son woke up and he had a symbol on his hand that was, uh, raised upside down triangle. It was almost a complete triangle on the, the top section only went across halfway and then the rest of it was a perfect triangle. Looked like a raised burn scar. Like somebody had branded him and there was no pain. There was no, you know, uh, it, I don't, I don't know what to, I have no idea. You know, I'm, 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 frustrated with the situation because they took me or they they made it look like they took me because you know i've recently i've been uh, i've been reading a lot of uh do you know or are you familiar with uh dr joseph uh, burke no 
Okay. He used to be partners with uh, in the uh, C SETI program with uh, with Dr. Greer. And uh, as far as stuff that I've been reading recently, because I haven't done a lot of uh, reading uh, on the subject recently, and just got involved with these groups, and just have started to reach out to people like yourself, because. Um, I believe it's time to start sharing this information and uh, I, I have to get it off my chest. I have to be able to get some pieces from other people's puzzle to put in my puzzle if I can to make the picture bigger to try and understand what's going on with all of it. But um, he, he brings up the virtual experience model and his theory is that uh, they're able to use uh, directed uh, um, directed intelligence to make us see these things. So the objects that we're actually seeing and we're having experiences with, even if we're having experiences with other people, might very well be a projected image that's being projected into us to witness. And having read that and looking at the experience, um, I could see it being, uh, it, it could possibly be some other things because uh, of the situation that was involved because I don't remember anything other than the, the light appearing and then coming to with the light flying off. And I had the experience in 2015, I told you about with the airfield. Well, and before we get into that, did your son realize that something happened that you know the night prior to getting the? Uh... He had no remembrance of anything. He woke up in the morning. I saw the symbol on him. I pointed it out to him. I didn't make a big deal about it, and I didn't tell him about my uh, abduction. At that point, he he's had experiences with me, um, and he he had a. Um, he had an experience when I uh, first got divorced and I was a single dad and he was living with me at age two and a half. Um, there's some great stories about him. And uh, when he was two and a half, he, when he was born, he was born with uh, cyclic neutropenia, which is a white blood cell deficiency. When you have cyclic neutropenia, your white blood cell count goes up and down, and it goes up and down in cycles. So they, they have, when it first started happening, they were trying to figure out the cycle that it's on to try and be able to correct it um, to make sure that, that uh, he's not getting sick. So when he was young, for the first two and a half years of his, uh, his life, I was quit my job and was a stay-at-home dad and took care of him and raised him. and um, uh, he had to go to the doctor every week and had to get uh, uh, nicks on his heel. They would cut his heel to take blood. And if he ever got sick, it was, it was a trip to the, to the emergency room at Children's Hospital and he was inputted into the hospital and there were many nights there with him and, and it, was, it was very, very frustrating. And um, the doctor said, you know, this is something that might rectify itself. Sometimes it rectifies itself. Um, other times it's a lifelong thing. Well, I had just gotten separated from my wife and I had moved into this new apartment. Um, this was back by the place where I had the encounter with the, uh, the, the crow and the, the giant owl. Well, we were at my apartment and I had him week to week. We, I would have him for one week and then my ex-wife would have him for the following week. So he was over at my house and bedroom. So I'd put, I, I was getting ready to put him to bed and, and he wanted him to go outside and see the moon. See, he says, I want to go and see the moon. He wasn't, he, he was talking at that time, but he would, he would talk, call himself in the third person. He would, you know, say, I'm, it's so-and-so wants to go out to the outside. You know, and I said, okay, well, let, let's go outside. And he wants to look at the moon. So we went outside and we were standing there and I was holding him. We were looking at the moon. It was a full moon out. And I saw an object appear in the sky and he saw it and we were both looking at it and then it just dropped like it fell out of the sky to the ground and from the distance from where my parking lot was it looked like this thing would be up across the 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 uh i i came off of a major uh two-lane road you turned on a, onto a, a two-lane street uh, to go to my complex and it this thing probably would have been uh, in the clearing on the other side of the major road 
okay, as far as its distance. It looked like a star in the sky, but it was, it was big and bright. It looked like uh, Jupiter, you know? So it appeared and it drops down. I didn't really think anything of it. I mean, I've, I've seen so much stuff at that point. I, you know, I was just like, okay, that was odd. Um, took him in, put him to bed. From the, the time that he was born until this experience, I spent every minute with him. He never, ever, ever had a nightmare. Never, ever fussed. Never once had night terrors. I put him to bed. I went into the living room and I was reading a book. And maybe an hour later, I woke up to him screaming bloody murder in the other room. Just screaming, you know, terrified. I, I hopped up. I ran into the room. I picked him up. I started comforting him. I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? He said, yeah, and was, was crying, was starting to calm down. And he says, I want to go outside and see the moon. So I'm comforting him in him. I took him outside to see the moon. And we walked outside and we were standing in the exact same spot outside my front door looking at the moon. And he looked at me and he says, mm, they, they took me up into the sky. You know, as he says his name because he talks himself in third person. He says, they, they took so-and-so up into the sky. I said, really? I said, who did? And he says, the mean robot and the monster. And I said, the mean robot and the monster, what did they do then? And he said, they touched my belly and there was blood. And I said, okay, then what happened? And he said, they brought me back. I was freaked out. I immediately hopped. I, I had souls holding him. I hopped in my car. I grabbed a manila envelope out of my glove box and I wrote it down word for word verbatim. And that stayed in my research book for a long time. Like that really affected me. Well, literally three weeks later, maybe four weeks at the most, I take him in for his update with the doctor to get blood work done. And the cyclic neutropenia has completely rectified itself. There was no trace of it, never have seen a trace of it ever again, right after this experience where he claims that there was blood on his belly and the monster and the robot took him up into the sky. The only robot he had ever seen at that point was the robot on Yo Gabba Gabba. And when we, when we would go hiking after the incident, uh, uh, that incident, I would take him back to that section of the woods where I had the encounter with the uh, owl and the crow. And there was a big clearing out there and we used to go uh, walking back there for, for fun to get into nature. And he was terrified of the path between the woods up to the clearing that he kept seeing, saying that he would see the robot up in the trees. Did he ever describe those two uh, beings? Uh... No, I never. I never wanted to. Uh, I, I never wanted to influence him in any way in regards to. That's why when when he mentioned what was going on, I, I questioned him the way that I questioned him. So I wasn't misleading him, or or you know, there wasn't no question in my mind that whatever information he was giving me was what he truthfully believed happened. And uh, he. He's had experiences with me since uh, we, we, during the 2015-2016 uh, the Ellet flap of all the stuff I was seeing over there. He would come out on the porch and witness them with me. You know, I'd, be, I'd go out every night and would look and, and he, he would be inside the, with the screen door open and watching TV and, and I would call him out sometimes then he would come out and see craft with me. And then we had an experience with a buddy of mine and I was camping with, with my son and a good buddy of mine and his two boys and we were out at Portage Lakes, which is a place that I used to camp at uh, probably about 20 miles from where I lived in Ellet. And it's a, a network of Finger Lakes and a really, really nice area. and. Um, camped out there a lot and, and had gone out there with my friend and invited him and, and we all had an encounter with a uh, huge cigar shaped object that's in the picture there with uh, over the lake. We, we had been camping, uh, we'd been hanging out during the day and we had chilled out with the kids and played uh, baseball and you know made food and cooked marshmallows and the sun had gone down and it was dark and we decided to go and look at the water. And uh, we were walking from my campsite up to this, uh, this parking lot, which is completely empty. You go through the parking lot and then you're on the edge of what they call the beach. And there's an island out uh, from it in the center of the lake. 
And uh, when we were walking from the campsite, the kids were in front of us, probably six feet in front of us, running towards the water. And me and my friend were talking to each other. And I look up and I see an object with lights flying over us. And he looks up at the same time and he looks at me and he's like, what's that? I'm like, I don't know. And it was completely silent. And we caught up to the kids and we sat down to look at the water and the stars. And there's a giant cigar shaped object that's all black. It was the size of the blimp because I see the blimp all the time when I lived over there. I mean, I would see it launch all the time over there. It, li it lives in the uh, big hangar that they have at the airfield there. And this thing was a perfect cigar shaped Tic Tac, two giant white lights on, on the uh, right end of it, two really small red lights on the left end of it, completely silent, um, hovering over the water next to it. And we're all sitting there watching it. And, you know, Patrick and, and my friend and I were looking at each other and, um, we're looking at each other. Sorry, having a problem here. Oh shoot, one, okay. There we are, sorry about that. Um, we, uh, we were watching it and my friend Patrick says, you know, are you seeing this? And I said, yeah, I'm seeing it. And the kids were seeing it and we're, we're just sitting there watching it. And there's, there was a group of maybe two or three people that were up to our left that were sitting in the grass that you look at on the picture there on the left side of the picture, they were sitting there fishing and there's no way that they could have missed this thing. And I, I actually, while I was sitting there, I'm, I'm like, should I even should I say something to these people to see if they're seeing this? because I was really stunned at the fact that they seemed oblivious to the fact that this was going on. And, you know, there was no, no way that they were missing this. And, and if they were seeing it, I don't see how they couldn't have been like, what is that? Because, it, you, you know, it, it was no blimp. It was no aircraft. There was no sound. And, and this thing, we sat there and this thing uh, disappeared in the blink of an eye, like somebody switched off a switch, it hopped over to the other side of the, uh, the island on the right side of the island and reappeared in the blink of an eye. Sat there for a couple seconds and then they, they, it was again, flip of a switch, gone, and boom, right back where it was. And we all saw it. Um, you know, uh, after that point then is, uh, is when my, my friend's youngest kid started to get a little wigged out and said he wanted to go back and go to sleep. So Patrick took him back to the tent and I hung out with my boy and uh, my friend's buddy or son. And, and uh, we sat there and the three of us watched it for like another 20 minutes. And it was still there when we went back to the camp. Wow. Yeah. And you're lucky. No, well, you know, I've, I've had my own sightings, but you've been having a lot. Yes. I've had an exorbitant amount. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, like I said, the, um, the, the nature of some of these experiences is just, it's beyond me. And, you know, the things that they've demonstrated, I feel like the, the, the experiences that I've had in the last five years of my life have been like them showing me, uh, kind of like showing off, showing me the things that they can do, you know? Because it, as I said, I have a pretty good understanding of physics and, and science and, uh, you know, metaphysics, quantum theory, you know? And, and the, the, these things, uh, the physics, our physics do, does not affect them in any way, shape or time. They're able to manipulate time as we know it, space time. Um, I, I think that these things definitely are interstellar, but I think that they're also interdimensional. You know, we're dealing with things that are on in the fourth, fifth dimension on up, and that, you know, when you get beyond these, these beings, I believe, are, uh, like from your interview with the ladies, uh, I really enjoyed how they described that they, the, uh, 
the grays describe them as vessels. And I believe that as well, that and, and uh, Whitley Strieber has described in his books, he made a statement uh, about them saying to him that they recycle souls. And I think that, that they, they have something to do with the, the, uh, the reincarnation of the soul and the incarnating of the soul. And, and that they are, you know, they are doing things with humans to uh, uh, further whatever their agenda is for taking part in it, but also furthering the advancement of the species in a spiritual sense, because all the experiences that I've had have uh, blown my mind and made me look at uh, religion and theology and our ideas of creation and, and uh, uh, look at those subjects and, and, uh, and be able to see them in a different light because um, none of it works. And I was always, I was always thought that, you know, and I love religion and I love theology. And I, I believe in, I believe the majority of the world's religions are, are here and uh, have truth in them about light and love. And, and that, that is, those are the true truth and that there's this truth in many different flavors so to speak. And the Krishnas wrote a book that I, I enjoyed called All One God, where they go and they pull quotes from the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible. And they all basically say the same thing. You know, the teacher and the avatar is different. And I believe that those, those spiritual teachers were, were uh, a lot of them um, souls from elsewhere, you know? Did you say, um, I think your, your father is military? Yes, he was, uh, was uh, ex-Navy. He was a uh, pilot. Uh, he flew a sub-hunter in between uh, the end of World War II and the Korean War. And he had top secret clearance with the Navy uh, uh, because he had a nuclear-equipped uh, plane. He flew with... Uh, another pilot and one other guy uh, who was like a radar or a, um, a bomber person. And um, they flew uh, missions in between uh, the Korean War and World War II uh, uh, locating subs. Now, could that be the reason why you've got contact or was it because of the, your, your past uh, connections with uh, the native people? I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, really don't, because I mean, um, my father was in charge of, uh, when I grew up, um, he was in charge of uh, uh, plant engineering for 35 years with RCA Corporation. RCA Corporation was one of the first developers of integrated circuits, and they did a large amount of work with the military subcontractors and NASA and the military. I never got to hear anything about the military stuff because all that stuff was probably classified. And, and uh, I've had conversations with my father and he claimed he never worked on anything, you know, secret or whatever. But I, I don't know if I believe that or not. He traveled around a lot when I was young. I mean, I remember him coming back and forth from Russia all the time and, and Japan. And he developed integrated circuits for, for uh, RCA corporations, held several patents, uh, traveled for them all the time, um, did work with uh, NASA on the uh, Voyager satellite. Um, I was handed a pack of uh, Kodak eight by 10 photos from the Voyager that he had, was handed from NASA that he gave me when I was a child after they had gotten back the, uh, the films from the Voyager. So, I mean, he had definitely had his hands involved with some things. If, if he's working on stuff and they're working with NASA and they're doing uh, <laughs> all the, all the chips for, you know, the, the, uh, technology for what they're doing with Voyager, you know, he's obviously involved in some things. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not. Okay. And then the whole, uh, if you want to get into the whole strangeness, uh, more strangeness factor, both him and my grandfather were 33rd degree Masons. My grandfather and my dad's side and my father were both 33rd degree Masons. Well, that could be a, a, a factor. I don't know if it is or not. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, and the whole, uh, that's one thing that I liked about Strieber's books in regards to looking at uh, uh, archetypes and um, fairies and elf lore and uh, its uh, similarities between fairies, fairy stories and uh, the interactions with fairy beings and uh, the interactions with uh, ETs or UFOs or whatever you want to label them. Um, that there there are strong strong similarities in regards to the stories, and uh, that you know a lot of a lot of people in the uh, in the research uh, UFO field believe that you know those those archetypes were were used to describe these things uh, you know at earlier times, and that we very well could be dealing with the same being or or. Uh, spirit in vessel or you know whatever you want to interpret it because you know for me the uh the definition of what i'm dealing with uh can't be pinpointed you know i can't uh because especially dealing with these with the uh, orbs and these lights uh these non-human intelligences uh, i don't know if i'm dealing with a spirit or if i'm dealing with um an entity that's just showing up in light form or is that is that some sort of some sort of high technology that that's just like a drone that they're sending out from a ship to encounter me and they're able to blink it back because they can see what it's doing and what i'm doing to it you know i don't i don't know um i have no idea i would love, I would love to see one in person We've got, how about we, uh, we wrap it up with the, um, I don't know, we've got really two, I've got two drawings here that we, we need to, to get into. Uh, the chair with the, the star map. That's a memory that I have of uh, a lot of my experiences and, and will, that will lead into the last picture with the uh, blue being. That was from uh, the beginning of 2017 from a lucid dream. Um, I have very, very intense lucid dreams. Um, they contact me and take me during lucid dream experiences. Um, I think at that point when I'm having those experiences, um, because you know, with lucid dreaming, the the the, the experiences are seem ultra real, more real than reality. Um, I have a lot of experiences where I'm I'm able to just, I levitate easily in my lucid dreams. If I'm able to have a lucid dream and I can consciously uh, re consciously realize that I'm there and I'm experiencing the dream, I'm able to levitate and fly whenever I want, which is really cool. <laughs> I love that. Um, but I, uh, the experience that I have about the star map room is I have a, a memory of being on ship with uh, uh, one of the drones, the little guys, uh, three and a half, four feet tall. And he took me into a round room that was uh, just an empty lit round room, no fixtures, no light fixtures or anything, but it was it was lit up and there was a single chair in the center of it. And he went in and sat in the chair and uh, when he sat in the chair, the room went black and uh, stars appeared in, in a 360 degree 3D map of a bunch of different stars. And uh, I felt like they were showing me something in regards to their navigation and how they're able to uh, able to use that as, as some type of mapping or navigation for the craft um, to uh, be able to go from point A to point B. And uh, I felt like they were showing me different constellations because none of these things were recognizable to me. And, you know, I'm familiar with our constellations and our astronomy, but, I, you know, none of the, I don't remember any of these things. I don't remember any details of the maps or anything like that. I just remember the experience. And then the last experience with the blue beings i had a lucid experience in 2017 it was probably in i don't know may um i had uh woke up or uh, from this experience and had had just like immediately had uh, came out of it and was remembered where i was at in the dream and everything and they they had, uh, the two little guys had taken me I, it was a big ship and I, you know, I tried to as remember as much detail for you in that drawing as possible. But these, the, 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 there were more people in the background that, or more uh, uh, entities in the background on that walkway 
and a lot of hustle bustle and activity going on beyond what was going on with me. But I was engaged with the, the, the two drones that took me to meet this tall blue being. And the tall blue being, um, when they took me to him, I, it, it was funny in the dream, I was just so amazed by how this thing looked that all I could do in this, and it was funny because they were like, they don't get mad. I don't ever sense that the, that they're, they're mad at me about anything. Like they don't show emotions like we do, but they, they, they were kind of like, really? I got this like really vibe, you know, like we brought you here to this guy because he's super important and you, you've been wanting to, you know, learn more. <laughs> and here they take me in front of this thing and all I can do is look at it up and down and and ogle it and be like wow I just kept thinking in my mind wow wow because it was so amazing it was uh the the picture does not do it justice it was a translucent blue green light being that was like uh, you could see through it but it 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 was <laughs> It looked solid, like it was a real person in front of me, but it was translucent and it was it was moving, like like it, the colors in it were were constantly just like swirling and and uh, and changing, and it was just so overwhelmingly beautiful to look at that I couldn't even begin to try and communicate with it. It had very Africanized features and it had uh, feline type gold eyes really? yeah very very african features big cheek high cheekbones you know more squared off his face african type nose african type lips and and like i said they the i got the vibe from the little ones like they were just like oh gosh you know like really <laughs> like they were disappointed in me because I just couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't grasp, you know, I felt like a jerk afterwards. I woke up and I felt like, okay, I feel like I failed them in some sort of way because I wasn't able to, I wasn't up for the task and I wanted to be. <laughs> they say anything to you? No, they don't. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't get much of the, like they're, uh, communicating to me in regards to wanting to answer my questions or anything. It's only recently become when, when I had the contact and I, I reached out and was like, you know, you need to start, you need to start letting me be a conscious participant in this. So I'm not feeling like a victim, you know? And that's when the, 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 the things increased. And all during that time, there was, there was all sorts of, as they say, high strangeness going on in, in my place. Um, my, both me and my son would be in the living room and we would witness, uh, we had a mirror on my hallway door. From, uh, so you looked in from the living room and it would reflect my bedroom um, off down the hallway. And you could see part into my bedroom if you were sitting on the right spot on the couch in the living room. Well, we were sitting in there and this happened numerous times where you would see a bright, bright blue flash, like the, like the whole room lit up and we'd catch it reflecting in the mirror. And I'd look at him and he'd be like, did you see that? And I'd be like, yeah, I saw that, you know, and many times I got up and went in the other room and there's nothing there. Um, during that time, things would, you know, disappear uh, just objects that i would have uh, it could be anything it could be you know whatever I, I i i very specific where i keep things and i would be going to look for an object and i know i set it down there and it's not there and it would be gone and i would look for it and a day would go by and i wouldn't find it and then it would be right back where it was when I find it the next day. And that sort of stuff was going on very frequently. I even confronted my son about it. And I said, you're not playing with me and moving things on me, are you? And he's like, no. And, uh, you know, two times during that period, the, the, uh, I was touched. I was tapped on the shoulder once and um, something came over and touched me when I was laying in bed one night, but there was nothing there. Well, I got felt up a lot for chat, you know, like, let's say almost every two months from the, uh, from 2009 to 2016. So that was pretty freaky. 
but you know, I always thought it was spirit. I'm not sure if it was ET related, but who knows? Yeah, um, I, I, I never really had uh, any any spirit things going on that I thought in regards to. I mean, I'm I'm an empath. I've I've always been very very uh, in tune with. Uh, uh, you know, I have I have extrasensory perception. I have psychic abilities. I have clairvoyant. You know, I, I have uh, clear uh, buoyant dreams where I'll have dream I'll have dreams ahead of time before things happen, and then they'll happen, and I, I will have a deja vu experience, and I'll totally remember having re remembered or been in that experience before. That happens a lot. Um, I'm able to read people really well with the empathic thing. It was hard growing up before I learned anything about how to protect myself in regards to uh, like when when I was a young adult. Um, I ended up learning um, different ways that you can protect yourself from from negative energies and things like that. I had a, a girlfriend that I dated for a while that introduced me to Wicca. I had never really knew anything about Wicca. And uh, she taught me a lot about nature, uh, nature work with uh, white witchcraft. So you never had any paranormal stuff? I have. Uh, I had an experience. Uh, I saw a ghost once in uh, 2017 when I was out in Colorado, out in Colorado Springs. Okay. Uh, that's the only time I've ever seen anything like that. As far as um, anything that I would deem paranormal or, you know, when, when these things started happening in, in the house, I really didn't associate it with the, the UFO thing or the star people. I didn't, I, they just didn't, I didn't know anything about that, you know, and it's until I've recently, you know, since I've gotten in contact with you, I just joined, I just came out of a deep, deep, deep slumber on Facebook. I haven't communicated with my group of people for a long time. I've been in like self-isolation and, and uh, just doing my work and dealing with my relationship with my child. And uh, like I said, I reached a point where I'm like, you know, I joined the CE5 page because of, I really enjoyed Dr. Greer's film and i think that uh, you know what he's doing is definitely moving things forward in the mass populist sense it's getting people to think about things and getting people to engage things uh, and i think that that's good but also you know when you're dealing with this too you're having to uh, educate people who haven't been involved with this stuff all their life and haven't had these experiences or done any research and you know i'm I'm definitely leery of the uh, certain aspects of the ufology uh, field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of people that that uh, are in it for uh, selfish reasons and not in it for the right reasons. You know, like all human endeavors. But I think that uh, I think that the majority of it's an exciting time to be living because you know you have people like Dr. Greer out here doing things that are bringing things to the forefront of the general populace, whether they're paying attention or not. Because I mean, I was just having a conversation with my sister last night about it. Um, she's rather reluctant to listen to me about viewing any of these things to uh, get on a higher page. And uh, she's a journalist, and I've been battling her for years. You know. Um, I'm I'm a, a joker because she's a social justice warrior, <laughs> and I'm like you don't you don't know what you don't know who Stephen Greer or what C said he is, and and you didn't see the footage from uh, the Pentagon a couple weeks ago, <laughs> which is old as we know, anyways. But you know, uh, it's it, I it's frustrating for me because there's so many people who just want to live like that and ignore what's going on, and you know you've got the science community who wants to ignore it because if if they're they're doing any real science and they bring that up, that's a career killer. You know the, they we're not looking at it the way the way that we should and i you know since i've joined that page and i found uh, somebody found me because i was getting ready that i'm like okay i cannot even begin to look at the posts here and and comment because i'm going to be too frustrated with all the inane <laughs> questions i was seeing so i somebody invited me to a private uh, ce5 page and that's how i ended up uh, getting invited to a couple other pages experiencer page and then that's how i met you and i've been actually uh connecting with a lot of really intelligent people that are involved in the uh 
the experiencer. Okay. But would this be the first time you're coming out? Yeah. Okay. Other than yeah, I mean, I've I've had close friends that I mean that that know about it and that I've I've definitely had conversations with, but I don't go out. Uh, proselytizing to people about it because uh you know there's the whole stigma of you're freaking crazy if you're having ufo experiences and you know it, when you get to a point somebody had posted something the other day and i made a comment they had said so oh, they had posted a poster of the uh molder poster from the x files i i want to believe and they crossed out they were the want and the two and it says i believe and i said I know is better. And there's, as you know, there's a very, very big difference between believe and know. Because when you know, you know. And there's no question and there's no worry about having to try and explain yourself to anybody else because you know in the, your soul of souls that this is real, this is happening, you're intelligent, other people are having the same thing go on. And, you know, there's no way that you can deny that this, I, I think that if you are in a position of thinking that you're, you're doing something for the planet and the human race, if you're not looking at this as the most important subject of our time, you're crazy. Yeah. Because it, this, it, we, we, I feel that everything that they've shown me in my existence uh, has has been building up to this point and that we and i felt like this for a long time i mean i had these these ideas in my early 20s 2021 i was thinking about these things about how we we as a human species are at the time when we are going to uh make it or it's going to fail and if we don't advance we are going to destroy ourselves. And I don't believe that it's going to necessarily mean the end of the, the race. There might still be scattering pockets of people that survive whatever, uh, whatever catastrophe that is going to come our way because we're, we're destroying the planet. Um, it's a living organism. We're all interconnected. We're all interconnected with these species in the universe through mind and conscious uh, uh, interaction. And the planet and animals is the same way. And that if we don't make the leap we it's going to be it and i mean i've i feel that i've been given information from them that uh because i was very fearful as a child growing up they showed me things growing up about the end of the world that you see from other people that ex have experienced or things i've i've ha had reoccurring nightmares as a child of all sorts of end of the world catastrophes and that was a reoccurring thing growing up and um that really affected me and and all along i've i've been able to look at through my existence as far as my consciousness and awareness of what's going on in our world and how we view things as a species and what we're doing with war and technology and uh, petro fuel and all that we're, we're destroying the planet and we're killing each other and we are ignoring the fact that everything's pointing us in this direction that we have to advance spiritually in order to catch up with us where we're at technologically. Because right now we're more technologically advanced than we are spiritually. And there were times in our existence when we were way more spiritually tied to the planet and, and uh, you know, living in balance with nature. And that's what needs to occur. But I don't necessarily think that we're going to make it. And I'm not worried about it because uh you know they've made it perfectly clear to me and i've i've read other encounters with people where they've had similar experiences that um they have been shown another place that's very similar to the earth all except it's very it's very unadulterated in and natural in its nature and everything and uh, you know i think that that's a spot that they will take certain people to if if it becomes a cataclysmic situation where uh, there are going to be large, large amounts of the population dying, if not the human race killing itself off. And I think if something like that happens, that they would step in and and take people that are on a, on a higher vibrational frequency because we need to we need to make that that uh, evolutionary step or I don't think we're going to make it. And I want to have faith in us as a species and, and as a, um, a conscious 
sentient being in the universe. I want us to survive. I want us, but I want us to be able to step into. Uh, we should be in the stars already. We should be traveling the stars, and we have the technology. You know, Ben Rich said it before he died, and you know, there's there's all sorts of stuff that our government has secrets on in regards to anti gravity and and you know, just today I was I was uh, reading someone's comment and saw an article about. Uh, 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 directed energy weapons. The 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 Pentagon just released that 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 the information in regards to directed energy weapons uh, to the public, and uh, you know they've had that particle beam technology for a while, and that all goes back to that whole uh, beginning of this this uh, alien threat thing with Reagan, you know. Well, they still got the the, the asteroid threat. You know, if it's, you know, the part of the, you know, the list. That's my thing about that. If there's an, a if there's an asteroid coming in and is going to do us in or destroy the planet, we don't have any, cho any choice in the matter or anything we can do anyways. So, you know what, if it would happen, or even if they knew it was going to happen, same thing with uh, all these uh, scientists and people talking about the pole shift and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, there's all sorts of things that could happen that, that could uh, cause major major destruction but i don't think i think the whole asteroid thing is uh you know if if even if our science best scientists and, and governments knew that that was going on or was going to go on they would not release that to anybody well you no, know, they normally release it like uh a week later saying that you know this yes, asteroid yes. yeah uh, just watch. narrowly yeah you know and that's been happening a lot but i think that you know it's it's one of those things you know it's all about control and about uh uh the, the contingency plan is in place for all these people. You know, there's deep underground military bases all across the U.S. and in other countries for the, the top military people and the top government people. They're all going to be whisked away to their secure underground bunker while we're all left to be at home and then, oh, wow, yeah, an asteroid just hit the planet. Um, they're not going to tell anybody about it because they're not going to induce general panic everywhere. So it would be one of those things that you were, were just the last to know and it's collateral damage and sorry, you know, yeah, you know. Yeah, but you know, it can happen so fast, you won't even notice it. No, and, and I, you know, if something like that happens, uh, you know, there isn't anything that we could do anyways in regards to a giant asteroid hitting the planet. If that happens, you know, that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. That very well could come and wipe us out. You know, well, second of all, you know, this ain't our first lifetime. So, oh, no, 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 no. And well, one, you know, that's one thing that I didn't touch base with you on, but I've had, I know I've had past life experiences. I, I remember being incarnated as a man before and a woman before, and I have uh, had memories since all this has gone on where uh, I've had lucid experiences where I was uh, uh, one of these entities. Okay, there you go. That's <laughs> you know? And, and it was great. I mean, it, like, uh, I, I know that I, I have existed elsewhere, you know, and, and I think that that has a lot to do with it, you know, and, and the whole starseed thing is the fact that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, when I hear other people like the ladies that we were talking about with the gray interview i am amazed at the experiences that they are having and that they are able to be so uh consciously aware of what's going on with them because i've been pushing for that and trying for that for a long time and um i still feel like i'm waking up you know like I've always been waking up and like I know I have a plethora of information in my head that they have either blocked out with cover memories or have just blocked out and I'm not able to remember them until they want me to remember them. I feel like there's a timeline going on that they're working with and that I'm going to be able to remember, but it's going to be on, it's going to be on their timeline. It's, it has nothing to do with me wanting it and I want it because I'm like, you know, I'm tired of, of just getting bits and pieces of this. And that's what made me reach out to you when you asked me if I wanted to get interviewed. And Let's you know, I have- with um, the, uh, the symbol that you sent me. Oh, the symbol is just something that uh, I, I remember from many experiences with them during these lucid experiences being on the ship. And um, 
Oh, that was one thing I was describing when I was talking about the picture with the blue being um, on that craft. It was it was very, very large. I remember seeing like being able to see out and see the stars and, and the, the, the starscape and um, the walkway that they had me on. Um, there were levels. It was like the, the black to the left and the right of the pathway that I'm standing on with the with the entities. Um, the, they it's like you could look down into the ship and there were other levels. So, so it, it, like the level that I was on where you saw walkways, there was more of those going down, but I, I, I didn't know how to go about doing it in the drawing to be able to describe it, you know, especially with the amount of time and the amount of drawings I did. <laughs> you worked a lot faster. Okay, uh -huh. so, so let's, uh, yeah, call it a night. We can always do a part two yes. later on down the road. Yeah, I um, so. definitely. Well, yeah. We need to talk about the uh, the giant football-sized craft. <laughs> We've been at it for two hours now. Oh, like I said, I, I knew when we first started talking. That's why I wanted to talk to you before we actually did the interview, because I knew that uh, once we got going, we could probably talk for four or five hours. Yeah, that's why I scheduled for four, just in case. But um, I have to uh, upload this to YouTube. Right. So so thanks yeah, for coming really, on. I really appreciate it, man. It's been enjoyable. And uh, anytime you want to talk to me again, I'm here. And uh, anybody that uh, this helps or anybody that has any information that is triggered by my experience, I would love any uh, bits of crumbs. Well, they, uh, they just have to uh, send me an email and uh, I'll communicate with you and uh, yeah, then you can communicate with them after that. That would be fantastic. I'm, I'm more than willing to talk to anybody. So, okay. so. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Neil. And I uh, hope uh, those that have been watching, you enjoyed this. And um, I hope so, so I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Take care, Yannick. Take care.